Kia ora team, Chris Fahey here. Welcome to another deep dive into the biggest corporate real estate news from New Zealand and around the world. So with this month's news, one of the themes that's really coming through strongly is owned real estate. And so different things like refurbishment and redevelopment of corporates that own their real estate around the world. So for all you people who are contemplating the lease versus own decision out there, this one's sort of a little bit of a treat for you. So with that said, we'll get into the news. Before we start though, quickly give that like button a smash and yep, we'll crank into it. So first up this month, we're starting in New Zealand where Parliament announced that there will be three new buildings developed on the parliamentary campus. So just looking at my notes, there's a new six story building behind Parliament House, um, a replacement of the earthquake prone executive wing and a small building for secure deliveries. And so the projects all up have been estimated to cost around $200 million. So I do a lot of work in corporate real estate decision making, particularly for public sector entities. And one of the questions that's commonly asked is the merits of leasing versus owning properties. And so in a lot of cases for government entities, they've historically owned their properties. Um, and then as they come to redevelop or look for new space, the big question is quite often, should they continue to own properties or should they move into lease premises? So in this case, they've actually chosen to move from some leased premises into owned buildings. And so if you look at the announcement that was made by the House Speaker, a couple of comments were that the cost of the new buildings would be less than 30 years of rent for the old premises, um, and also the benefit of avoiding foreign ownership of the buildings. So those are quite interesting drivers, particularly around the foreign ownership issue and specifically for central government sites that have a really core role in government. So I thought that was quite interesting. The second interesting aspect is that the new buildings will be carbon net zero. So this aligns with the government's recent announcements around more sustainable buildings and aligns more widely with their sustainability sort of strategy. This is also pretty interesting because carbon net zero buildings are not something that we commonly see targeted by the private sector. So it's interesting to see the government taking that lead, which might then inspire other corporates to be more aggressive around sustainability rather than just seeking things like neighbours or green star ratings. In terms of next steps, they'll be seeking funding for these developments in 2022 and the first project will start shortly after. Next up and also in the government sector, Ashburton District Council announced that they signed a construction contract for a new library and civic centre. So the project has a budget of 56 million and just looking at the notes, so it's been discussed since 2016 and was basically triggered by the existing facilities being too small and also having been assessed as earthquake prone. So projects like this are not unusual at the moment with a lot of councils um, looking at new spaces due to a range of things including asbestos issue, seismic strength issues with existing buildings or just the fact that they're getting really old and becoming quite shitty. So this is prompting a lot of councils to look at new buildings. Um, and I guess historically, if you went back in time, a lot of the existing buildings would have been developed during the 1950s and 60s. So I guess about now you'll see quite a large tranche of those buildings hitting the end of their lifespan. And those sort of issues will be further compounded by safety issues like asbestos and seismic, which have become much more strict over the last couple of years. So it's pretty exciting for Ashburton though, and I assume that will be one of the larger projects in the local area. Heading overseas, some pretty interesting news in the corporate headquarters space this month. So Qantas announced that they'll be retaining their headquarters in Sydney, and that they'll also be retaining the Jetstar headquarters in Melbourne. So like a lot of airlines, they've been reviewing their headquarters strategy as a way of responding to cost constraints due to the pandemic and reduced air travel. Now, um, if you look at Australia, the interesting thing here was that Qantas had actually gone to a series of state governments and was basically seeking like financial incentives to locate their headquarters in different states. So kind of like competing the states off against each other. Um, but in this case, after conducting their big review, they've basically elected to keep the two headquarters for each of those organizations in the same locations. So then shooting over to the United States, Under Armour announced that they'll be redeveloping a massive waterfront site for their global headquarters. This project's really big, so it will be bringing together about 1,700 employees, and it's due to complete by 2025. So this one's quite exciting. So if you go to the United States, Baltimore is one of the cities that's been reducing in population since about the 1950s. And so it's a city that's pretty well known for high levels of crime, although it has been regenerating since about the 2000s. And so a little random fact is there was a crime show called The Wire in the early 2000s, which was set there. 
and the reason I know that is I remember binge watching like eight seasons with my mate Jared while studying overseas. So shout out to Jared if you're watching. So heading back to the project, a um, couple of cool things. The first is that um, Under Armour has elected to stay in Baltimore and sort of respecting the heritage of the organization by staying in the current location. The second thing is that the project was originally designed in 2016 and what's happened is the new design has basically shrunk due to remote working patterns. So I guess it's had a material impact on the size of the project, which is quite cool. So the project itself looks really cool. So they've obviously got this new office building um, that they're putting on the site. They will be refurbishing this low rise kind of warehouse building and then keeping things on brand, they'll be adding a sports field to the site. Um, and then obviously a shit ton of car parking. When I was looking at the renders, one of the things I noticed, which um, might be a little bit different to you'd expect, is that the new office building is not sort of directly fronting the waterfront or maximizing its um, profile to the waterfront, um, which at first I thought was kind of weird, but then when you look at it, they're refurbishing the existing warehouse building. And so as a result, they're sort of constrained on what they can do on the site. So overall looks real cool. It's a shame that we have to wait a couple of years before we can actually see what it looks like in reality. Then also in corporate headquarters news, McLaren sold its massive headquarters in Woking, England to a New York based investment firm for £170 million. So the transaction itself was a sale and leaseback for 20 years, so it's more of like a financing transaction. Um, big shout out to my colleagues at Colliers in the UK for transacting this. Um, obviously a really massive deal for starters, but also really cool to see the use of the McLaren brand, so cool cars and, and that type of thing as part of the marketing collateral. So nice work. So finally, figured I'd quickly touch on some announcements made about remote working by different global firms over the past month. Um, remote work and its impact on corporate office environments is probably the biggest moving target in corporate real estate at the moment, as everyone speculates about what the impact of remote work might be on offices um, and interior working environments. So in my prior video, I discussed announcements made by Google, Amazon, and JP Morgan. So over the past month, some additional announcements came out from Google, Facebook, and KPMG. So this is May 2021, so a lot of the announcements being made at the moment relate to office reopenings. And in a lot of cases, the organizations are taking a chance to sort of communicate what some of their remote working policies will be like, um, because it is of so much interest to their employees. So Google announced that they'll be allowing up to 20% of their staff to remote work permanently. So this is interesting because last month they announced that they were expecting staff to be in the office at least three days a week once the offices reopen over the coming months. So I guess this is tweaking and sort of repositioning things for a partially remote workforce. Facebook made a similar announcement saying that they would allow remote work with approval from line managers. So I guess managing that sort of issue at a lower level in the organization. So the most interesting announcement though was KPMG in the UK, who announced that for their 16,000 staff, they'll be adopting a four day fortnight policy. And so what that means is that they'll be expecting staff to be in the office four days per fortnight, with the balance of their time spent between client sites and working from home. So it's definitely one of the more aggressive policy announcements that's been made around um, the level of remote work that they'll be expecting their employees to be doing. Alongside the policy announcement, they also indicated that they'll be spending about £44 million on improving the office spaces in relation to collaboration and also investing in staff to improve the work from home experience for employees. So I'd be really curious to see how that announcement plays out over time and whether that policy sticks. So that wraps it up for this month for the biggest corporate real estate from New Zealand and around the globe. Before you shoot off into the sunset, make sure to hit that like button. If you're watching on YouTube, smash that subscribe button and we'll see you next time. Cheers, bye.